Hi, I'm uh, Jefferson Cowie. I'm a historian at Vanderbilt University. I uh, mostly study U.S. political, social history with an eye towards uh, questions of economics and political equality. Um, and I'm happy to be here. Well, thank you. Uh, we are discussing your uh, recent book, uh, Freedom's Dominion, A Saga of Light Resistance to Federal Power. And I always kind of start this by asking, uh, what brought you to this topic and how you kind of um, investigated that? Right. Yeah. Um, well, there's kind of two prongs to that question, I guess, is what brought me to the question of freedom and then what brought me to the specific question of the topic of Barber County, Alabama. Um, the big question of freedom uh, was I kind of wanted, uh, you know, a big question about the nature of the United States. Uh, I did, My previous work had focused on either a decade or an event or a factory or whatever. And um and this was this was a sort of big enduring question and something I'd noticed that when people had invoked freedom, something that I reflexively believe in, of course, uh, we didn't always mean the same thing. And some people invoked it actually scared me. And I wanted to get to the bottom of kind of these conflicting ideas of freedom. And then the next question was, how do you write about that? And writing a national story in some ways is is it's interesting because you have to boil down a lot of information into sort of emblematic stories. And I was a little frustrated by that. I kind of wanted to find a way to talk about big questions through a little place or a little, or people, or, you know, this, I guess it's sort of a biographer's approach, right? How do you unpack a big story through uh, uh, compressed places or times? So uh, I stumbled across this obscure, uh, you know, otherwise obscure county in Alabama, and I began to think about maybe this would be a good place to to write about. And then later on, after I discovered it, I found that George Wallace, uh, the uh, segregationist governor of Alabama, was was from that county. And then it was fate, right? And then then I knew that was the right place. Well, and and it seems that uh, you uncovered a lot of um, troubling history that came out of this county. Um, but I think before we get into some of that history, the, just the idea of this, um, one of the things that you kind of really bring forward is that uh, white people specifically have a different version of American freedom than we think of, of maybe enslaved people or um, minorities coming to this country later. So maybe we could talk a little bit, begin by talking a little bit about what that white freedom is and what white people mean when they say they're being enslaved. Right, right. <laughs> yeah, we, 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 te we tend to think of freedom as a sort of emancipatory idea that oppressed peoples glom on to uh, a way to assert uh, equality uh, in the face of some sort of oppression. But I began to think, what, what if freedom is a source of oppression? What if... Uh, what if uh, we look at it in terms of the freedom to oppress? Uh, and then and then we have a much more complicated question. And, uh, you know, I at times I call it white freedom. I don't think all white people believe this, but there is a version of freedom that I, I often call white freedom or sometimes racialized anti-statism that basically looks at the fight against anything, especially federal power, that might constrain one's ability to oppress others, be they taking Native American lands, enslaving uh, people of African descent, uh, denying voting rights, whatever the case may be. Um, and that uh, those were often seen as attacks on white people's freedom. And, and this is more than just a Southern problem, I think, as Wallace proved. Um, but uh, but yeah, the real question is um, the slavery metaphor really becomes ubiquitous almost that uh, when the South secedes from the North, they do it because they will not be slaves to the tyranny, the federal tyranny of the North, right? Which is you got, and I think historically the way most historical writers have thought about this is well, that's just a kind of reflexive window dressing on what they want. You know, they don't really mean freedom. They can't possibly mean freedom. But I actually think that it's not just a rhetorical gesture. I actually think this is a core element of how Americans think about freedom. Mm 
Yeah, and you make that argument really uh, strongly in the book um, as far as like this idea that freedom to dominate, freedom to kind of um, have economic and state power is, is what they mean by freedom. And when they, I mean, the people who deploy it in this term. That's right. So the, um, I think we can begin probably by looking at uh, this county's relationship to Native Americans and kind of the weird, as we know in American history, um, you know, Andrew Jackson, his, his legacy has become one of, you know, the great uh, trail of tears and that kind of thing. But That's right. in this case, uh, his government was kind of on the side of Native Americans and treaties and and the creek and the intruders and you can kind of <laughs> delve That's into That's right, that. yeah. Yeah, so so typically Andrew Jackson is the clear villain of the Native American removal story. If you're on the side of the indigenous peoples, right? So he came through. He he stole a lot of Tennessee, most of Alabama, Georgia, um, on down t- through Louisiana, and uh, is the instigator, the chair of tears, all of that. Well, in this case, um, it's a slightly different story, um, and he's not quite the hero, but he's in a, in a much more ambivalent position. So there's a nine county region on the banks of the Chattahoochee River that divides Alabama and Georgia, which my county is the su- the, su- the county I'm studying is the southernmost county that is set aside as the Creek Nation, and uh, through a, through a treaty process that Andrew Jackson signed, and so. It's it's hard to wrap your head around this, but Andrew Jackson sent federal marshals and troops in to protect the creeks from white intruders, going so far as to burn down uh, the early settlement of of the white intruders into uh, Muscogee Creek uh, lands, and so this this sort of makes the historical head spin a little bit. Um, and it's not that I'm trying to salvage Jackson's reputation. What I'm trying to do actually is saying that even the mildest incursion of federal authority against white privilege to steal Native American lands ends up in this massive uproar. And Jackson is repudiated. The place is on the edge of civil war. There's martyrdom and, you know, all the stuff that actually ends in a in a fairly significant war known as the Second Creek War. But um, but this place is basically defending its free steel creek lands against the power of the federal government and the federal government is in some ways kind of the hero of the story but not a very good hero kind of this clay footed weak need you know the only source of authority that 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 uh, non white people can appeal to and and what's what was fascinating to me was the degree to which um, the Creek people were, were, were sending messages to Jackson and, and his secretary of war saying, send us troops, send troops in to protect us from these white intruders, right? Because we think about the American military as a source of oppression. But in fact, in this case, they were pleading with Jackson to live up to his obligations and protect them uh, under the treaty process that they signed. Well, and that, that's interesting because... Um... You kind of set it up so that the the federal government, you know, is seen as the protectors of the minority in this case, and you know, kind of followed this thread through. Um, but as a tyrannical, oppressive force to the white uh, intruders. So when and and you make the point that like when uh, it's going against white interest, federal government is seen as tyrannical. And, That's right. You know, so and you could kind of. Tell us how that kind of worked in this in this situation, but then also going forward a little bit. Right. Yeah. I think ideologically, the way it emerges is that you know the the tyranny of federal bayonets are always just on the horizon, just about to descend on the innocent white people and strip them of their freedoms. In this case, their freedom to steal lands. Later on, their their freedom to enslave other people, and um, and and so this is this is uh, helps to explain this kind of militant anti-government sentiment uh, that's kind of wrapped up in a weird patriotism, right? We believe in freedom, but we're against the government, you know. And freedom is the American creed, and it gets into some very complicated ideological territory. 
Um, and but I think you can sort of see it rolling through history right up to today, in which we see these appeals to uh, freedom against federal tyranny, authority, um, and often that freedom is wrapped up in the ability to control the land, labor, and politics of other people. Right, and um, I guess the one of the weird things about the the whole Creek Jackson thing is this idea that. Um, you know, Jackson had this idea that by granting them the treaty, they would want to move. Yeah. Free people. And it actually worked opposite and kind of. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, yeah. So, I mean, Jackson's not my hero here. I want to be really clear. But <laughs> but what he tried to do, uh, along with the Secretary of War Cass, was set up a privatization scheme. So they the he would they would survey all this uh, nine county region, carve it up into 120 acre plots, deed those plots to individual Native American peoples who would then pro hopefully in Jackson's eyes sell them uh, because it would be untenable and they wouldn't be able to compete with white people and stuff. And then they would move uh, voluntarily to Oklahoma or somewhere west of the Mississippi. Um, and but they were like we'll take this deal because we're a beleaguered and attacked people, but we want to stay. Right. And they, what they wanted to do, it was, was, was use it as a way to sort of leverage their position in the County and remain as much of a, a Creek nation as they possibly could. So Jackson sort of set himself up for this. Um, and, um, and ironically sends in Francis Scott key of all people um, to, um, help undo the mess that he made of the situation and of course uh francis scott key just makes it worse um and uh and this ends up blowing up and becoming a war yeah and then um what happens after the war so we have this kind of situation that doesn't work out mm -hmm. and the, um, the federal the creek have to take matters into their own hands basically that's, that's right that's right and so so when it becomes clear that the federal government is not going to back them up, um, they begin to have to fight back themselves. And as soon as the Native Americans fight, start attacking whites, then the federal government really steps in and fights in this war. Um, and so, so we really see, I mean, which side the federal government is fundamentally on and which suggests to me that actually the sort of the brittleness or the fragility with which sort of white identity uh, 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 interacts with the federal government. If it's not on my side, then it's evil. Uh, when it is on my side, great. Um, be, and that's the presumption that it will, in fact, be on, um, uh, on, on the white settler's side. But ultimately, the interesting thing to me about this was while Jackson is the hero to the kind of independent yeoman who was going to rush in across the border and set these little plantation or these little farms up, who the people really won were the elite speculators that were able to divide this up and uh, turn these turn this into um, uh, or make use of it as what it was, which is some of the most valuable real estate in the world. At that point, because it's in the middle of the Black Belt, which has this rich soil on which you can grow cotton. And so once it's settled, now you can bring enslaved people in from the east, march them across in these coffles, these horrible uh, marches, and uh, and carve these uh, immense plantations out of the wilderness. Well, and I guess the, the history of slavery and the secession and civil war is kind of uh, as to be expected, but there's this uh, kind of thread again, like leading up to the, the Civil War about anti-federalism and kind of this racialized anti-statism as you were talking about. And maybe you could kind of talk about how that emerged in this period, and then we'll get into emancipation, I suppose, in, in, through this conversation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, the first thing that comes to mind when I think about that is essentially the county that I'm studying is settled by 1840. One generation later, they're prepared to die to defend this based on tradition and, you know, flag and honor and uh, this deep reservoir of Southern uh, history. And you're like, you guys just got there, you know, <laughs> it's, it's, it's like, what are you talking about? 
And so the social construction of that sort of sense of honor and tradition based on sort of kind of really crass material values, I think, of uh, defending the independence of the cotton economy uh, is, is central. So um, so th this all happens in a fairly short period. Um, and um, and once when Lincoln is elected, uh, they go, you know, it's all it's a session fever across the board. They hang Lincoln in effigy as a oppressive, tyrannical black Republican is going to steal their rights. And those they're they're and they literally appeal to their rights as free men to enslave others. Um, and, you know, and, the, and while it sounds crazy or ironic or whatever to contemporary ears, this, this was, I think, a very honest rendering of how they saw their position, um, that they were victims. They weren't oppressors. They were victims. And they were victims of federal authority. And they needed to fight back against tyranny uh, because they were going to be enslaved because they had the metaphor right at their fingertips at all times. We know what this is because we're running this, right? Um, and so, um, and after the war, they become exactly what they fear, which is a subjugated, oppressed people at the end of federal bayonets. Right, and and I think uh, you have a, a quote that I pulled out, which is, um, I, I thought, incredibly profound, which is to speak of mass emancipation today without historicizing and understanding efforts by whites to recapture their freedom to dominate without seeing how emancipation of African Americans was made into the oppression of whites is to fail to understand a central problem of American history. Yeah. Which is crystallized so much <laughs> of like just that, what it meant to be, you know, and that's. Uh, uh -huh. Well, thank you for pulling that out. That's um, uh, made me sound smart. Uh, <laughs> it's not always, not always an easy task. Um, but yeah, I do think that's a good, there's a certain zero sum logic at work, right? If, if another group is free, then I'm oppressed. Right. And, and that it it's freedom in, a, in the American context, the American, this, this creed, this belief does not necessarily mean freedom for all. Uh, there's a sense that if you get it, I lose it. Um, because so much of my freedom is based on my capacity to, uh, oppress or dominate others. Um, and so this is sort of the, the, I see as sort of the, the ideological, the flaw in the core tenet of, of the American belief system. Um, well, and it, and it just locates it so perfectly within the context of everything that comes after it. Because if you look at <laughs> this like pivotal moment where it becomes a zero sum game, then affirmative action makes sense. Civil rights. Right. Segregation makes sense. And I guess we can move into um, how Reconstruction was right. one, of the worst thing that, one of the worst things that happened to them, even probably worse than the war in some in regards um, to this notion of white freedom, right? Yeah, I mean, the war was a hopeful moment. They're going to march off and show those Yankees what, what's going on and, and, and teach them all about Confederate honor and um, the great, you know, uh, tradition of valor and militarism of course it's a hor you know i don't need to tell that story it's a horrible miserable thing for everybody um bloody mess um but afterwards you're right uh now we have a period of direct oppression of white people right this is the you know the federal government that is supposed to be helping everything about white people uh it's a it's been a system of of supporting slavery it's been a system of subjugating native americans in a very radical move literally called radical reconstruction they are using tremendous by by those standards by the standards of the mid um 19th century tremendous uh federal force resources political power to try to reshape the South, to try to make it a functioning biracial democracy. And this requires three constitutional amendments. It requires the military occupation and subjugation of the South. It requires, um, you know, it, and it also includes all sorts of corruption and stuff that, that 
you know, people have probably blown out of proportion for generations. Um, but American politics is always about corruption. Um, uh, and all of this power is wielded against the white, mostly the white elite, really, of, of the South. The people have had the freedom to steal lands, the freedom to enslave others, the freedom to make a lot of money from both of those things. Because what we have to remember is that, especially the South, but much of the United States, is both a settler colonial society and a chattel slavery society. And we see elements of both of those all over the world. But the number of places where we see a very, very virulent version of settler colonialism and chattel slavery is fairly rare. And so I think that 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 and the fact that the idea of freedom is so central and this that we're connected to sort of Athenian democratic traditions in which freedom is central, also a slave society, I might add, um, that you put those together and you have this kind of uh, almost hyperbolic, hypersensitive version of freedom. And so after the war, after the Civil War, and federal troops are occupying the South, they're ensuring uh, voting rights, um, uh, the 13th, 14th, 15th Amendments are passed. They are, uh, white elites are feeling embattled, subjugated, oppressed, uh, victims of federal tyranny, their freedoms being stripped. And they try all sorts of crazy machinations to uh, slip the yoke of federal oppression, right? Uh, they're, they're, uh, they try to uh, support liberal Republicans in order to escape the oppressive Ulysses S. Grant and, uh, and things like this, until finally... Uh, having exhausted just about every avenue uh, in November 1874, they basically, in a violent coup, shoot black voters in the street um, and seize power through a violent coup, which they do specifically under the rhetoric of restoring their freedom, which is amazing, right? It's, it's um, you know, these... You can imagine it, right? These these uh, black voters who are mostly in the countryside uh, gather in the north and the south on election day and come into downtown Eufaula, Alabama, the set, the main town in this county, and they're lining up to vote and waiting waiting to vote, and then right when a signal is given. Uh, they open fire, they pull guns out of stores and out of storage sheds and closets and everything, and they just open fire. At least 80 people are shot um, in uh, this, you know, absolute horrible massacre. And so we wonder, oh, you know, whatever happened to the end of the Civil War? Well, that, well, that well, that's where it ends for Barber County and a lot of other places in a violent horrible massacre it's not just the tilden hayes compromise of 1877 where the federal troops decide to you know make a bargain and get out no it's power is seized violently in the name of freedom and restoring what was great about america uh, to use contemporary parlance um uh well before 1877 yeah and i want to get into the white terror um and the massacres in that in a minute um, and I think that the, you know, I think because Reconstruction is such a pivotal time where we see this great kind of like blossoming of egalitarianism and, and kind of a biracial uh, society that just never, like one side of it was constantly in rebellion against it. And um, it's just a fascinating uh, period because the North is really reluctant to make it happen at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. and And instead of going down and stopping these acts of violence, kind of capitulate to them. And, and I mean, it's that's like right. Yeah. I mean, um, this is back to my sort of uh, the federal government being the clay footed hero. Um, they're kind of there. Uh, they're kind of not. And, and in, in many ways, you, one could flip my argument a little bit and say they're there just enough to raise expectations and not enough to do the job. Um uh, because my argument is basically uh, a functioning democracy requires an aggressive uh, federal government to enforce the rules of democracy. That's kind of where the story ends. 
And that's what was happening in, under Reconstruction to an extraordinary degree compared to anything that ever happened before. You have to remember how weak the federal government was prior to this. Um, I mean, there's a lot big historiography now on how it wasn't as weak as we think. But the Reconstruction, Reconstruction is an enormous leap forward in federal authority and Reconstruction amendments reassert federal authority, reassert the right to vote, reassert uh, equal protection on the federal level. Um, and and so it's for real. And it works. You use the word blossoming. Absolutely. This is this is this is one of the most democratic moments in American history in a lot of ways. And it happened at bayonet point. Right. It required those federal troops to be down there and protecting it. And then when it failed is when word went out that the federal troops are going to stand down. And part of that is exhaustion from the North. Part of that is or uh, troop orders. And part of that is the economic crisis of 1873. So everybody's suddenly worried about their other things besides uh, the rights of black people. Well, and, and that, um, you know, the government, the federal government comes down and, and enforces this at the bayonet tip. But the anti-Reconstruction and the Redeemer, and this is kind of where we get into the white violence, um, reclaims it through, in some ways, more ter terrific, uh, terrific, that's not a word. But you know- Tyrannical? I, yeah, tyrannical, uh, <laughs> you know, basically terrorism against right. black people in a way that, you know, had that been done to white people as they feared, that black people would start doing this to them, right? Then, right. We're back to this flipping of the of the <laughs> racial dimensions of what freedom meant. Yeah, absolutely right. So, um, and this is this is this is one of the key lessons of the book is, and it becomes even more apparent under civil rights. This is the modern civil rights era. Is that black freedom was designed was defined by being a federal citizen, by being engaged in the federal level. White freedom is defined by being as far away from federal power as possible, which allows the opposite, and that's the subjugation of other people. Yeah, and I think that that um, leads me to another quote I pulled out, which, uh, you know, because we see after these kind of with the, the riot and the um, coup d'etat, you call it. Um, right. Yeah, I prefer not. I prefer not to call it a riot. That's that right, sounds yeah. like everybody just got angry and even threw right, things right. at each other. Right. Uh, <laughs> mass whatever it is. So the, right. uh, you know, there's this real program to like disenfranchise uh, black voters again, and it's done through you know this corruption and you know all this kind of stuff. But you have this quote here: disenfranchisement and segregation. Or not are not antithetical to Jeffersonian egalitarianism. They are essential. So maybe you could kind of talk us through. That's that. right. That's kind of a. <laughs> 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 I was like, what? Well, what would you say? But at the same time, what? <laughs> yeah, I hear you. I hear you. Right. So this is um, ultimately a critique of the Jeffersonian Jacksonian thread that runs through American history. Right. So if we go back to Jefferson, you know, when he, he, when he does, when he makes the Louisiana purchase, he calls it the empire of Liberty. Right. Uh, so a, it's an empire, which is not a sort site of Liberty. Um, B belongs to other people. C it's going to be pop. He doesn't really think this, but it is in fact going to be populated by enslaved people um, doing the, the worst work in the rise of global capitalism in the 19th century. So uh, the freedom that Jeffersonian freedom, well, Jefferson originally saw it as kind of this independent yeoman who would have his farm and his sep autonomy and come to the town square and debate issues um was was naive um uh i think and uh that it quickly became something much much uglier and uh and we see that especially you know so the core of jeffersonianism is keep the keep the federal government uh as limited small as you possibly can um uh keep all forms of government near and 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 small and cheap uh my argument is quite the opposite it's sort of a a, a more hamiltonian argument except 
uh it's not about economics which is what hamilton talked about it's about democracy um so that coup the coups uh, that i talk about in um the the in 1874 are really a re an attempt to restore that Jeffersonian order, uh, which is basically, um, you know, what they saw as Jefferson. They love Jefferson. They love Jackson. Uh, after, once they get over the <laughs> Indian stuff. Um, uh, and so they see themselves as the inheritors of Jeffersonian liberty. But now it's a Jeffersonian liberty based on specifically on racial oppressions and specifically on on uh trying to get the cotton economy going again large-scale planting and um, um engaging in sort of the entire global economy which is not necessarily jefferson's original intent yeah and that's that, thank you for that because i think it, it really um makes the point very well and um, one of the things that i would um kind of like to unpack a little bit more is how this white violence and the lynching and the and just the terror um, really reshapes the South and reshapes this county and kind of asserts this freedom again for white people that is, you know, once again, controlling black bodies, but also creating a uh, society of terror, you know, and, or, right. or continuing the society of terror, I guess would be. The mm -hmm. Well, you have a respite from it, right? I mean, I think during Reconstruction, there's a lot of hope. There's a lot of flourishing, blossoming of that biracial democracy. They come in uh, in uh, sort of following the Colfax massacre uh, the year before. They draw the what they call the white line, and they uh, destroy in a in this violence any hope for a biracial democracy. They redeem uh, the the. Well, white freedom and white power. And they do it by taking back from the from power from the federal government. The federal government uh, fades away, recedes. And it, all the most notorious aspects of Southern racial terror outside of slavery itself really emerge once the federal government is in repose, once it's pulling back. And after the after the 1870s, that's when we see all the, the convict leasing programs or sending convicts into the, some of the worst labor conditions the world has ever devised in the convict mines. That's when we're seeing lynching. Um, that's where uh, disenfranchisement, the segregationist constitutions throughout the South. All of this happens in the absence of federal power. This is freedom run. This is white freedom run amok, right? There's no check. On white freedom in that in in that period, roughly from the mid eighteen seventies up through the New Deal, and so that's when we see really this kind of um, unrestrained expression of white freedom. I'm this is probably, as far as I know, the only book that calls lynching an act of freedom, um, which is sort of a horrifying concept, right? Um, that absent any restraints, you can without without with impunity you can take the life of another person um and that is a form of freedom well and it, it's also striking that when law enforcement does get involved it's never to save it's to save the immediate life like to stop the mob because that's bad for white society but right. the, the person who's accused is always sentenced to death i mean the right. Justice system does what the mob does slower, and that, that yeah. Was, I I had a really hard time writing that that section, um, just emotionally, you know. And um, there's one section where um, a uh, the mob is thwarted, and uh, the this uh, black man is has a show trial. It's over and less than two hours and he's given the electric chair and the Chicago defender, the black newspaper says, well, they kind of celebrate it as a victory because there was some process. There was some legal due process and it was lynching by another form as far as I could tell. But any kind of process had been so far from from civil society at that point 
that uh, they were like, well, this is a step forward. Well, yeah. Right. And when you think about the step forward, that the huge step forward that Reconstruction gave, right. to see that how effective white freedom was in, in reasserting itself over the oppression of others, to, to see that like even the thumbnail sketch of <laughs> due process was seen as a progress. Exactly. Right. That's right. That's exactly right. And, and you're right. It, it was, it was typically, it didn't happen. Uh, it happened more as sort of a window dressing to prevent federal, any federal incursion. Cause even though uh, federal power had pulled out, uh, there was always a fear they were going to come back. Right. And that was the ambivalence about the new deal, right? Oh, money for development, money for the unemployed, things like that's good. But what else could they do? What if, what if it's not just for white people, right? Uh, so, you know, if, if they can, if the federal government can intervene to, you know, build post office and dams, uh, maybe they could intervene with race relations. So it's always kind of a, that, that was the beginning of the emergence of a sort of new turning point in, in local federal relations. Yeah, and also a kind of a turning point in um, kind of this white supremacist orientation, too. That's right. Um, yeah. Because it, it kind of turns to, well, we need to defend segregation. We need to de defend, you know, voting, keep keep voting white. We need to, you know. Um, yeah, that's, I mean, I have a I have a chapter called, again, back to Jefferson. Uh, I, uh, it's going to escape my mind, but it's something like a white oligarchy as Jeffersonian democracy, like that after the 1901 constitutions put in segregation, it was essentially using the rhetoric of Jeffersonian freedoms uh, to assert a small clique of people uh, in, in, in charge of the economy um, and disenfranchising both black people and poor whites. Um, and so, yeah, uh, there's some dark stuff dark stuff in this book <laughs> yeah there's some very difficult sections to read and um you know i'm glad you brought up jeffersonian again because i think while you were talking um and this leads us into wallace is that like you know the the jeffersonian yeoman farmer the yeoman farmer who shows up is george wallace <laughs> and, and, you know, god help us because here's this guy who <laughs> you know is is unrepentantly um racist i mean like you couldn't even showing clips of him today are shocking but at the time it was what we you know that's what that's how people talk i suppose right well the the interesting thing about wallace i think is is about race is uh, two things one he didn't he, he wasn't that's not i mean he studied barbara county very closely and he read he loved to read about barbara county he understood it all and so he wasn't uh, and he grew up hating the federal government. He grew up thinking Reconstruction was the worst thing that ever happened to the South. Uh, but he didn't necessarily, he was actually fairly uh, open-minded for a Southerner from his position uh, compared to a lot of people. Um, he, and he wanted to build trade schools and roads and, you know, things like that. Uh, it wasn't until after Brown versus Board that he really digs in and he says, oh, you know what? Um, there's a lot more votes to be gotten fighting the federal government that's coming in to take away your rights and privileges uh, than there is anything else. And so the second thing he does, not just switching towards a much more racialized politics, but he doesn't just cry race, 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 race all the time. He cries uh, anti-federal government, anti-federal government, anti-federal government, because that's going to create a bigger tent, right? You're only going to get, you're going to get the racists if you, if you, um, uh, say uh, the federal government's coming to take all of your power. That you'll naturally get the racists, but you're not going to get others if you just cry racism. But now you're going to get the anti-tax types, the deregulation types, the uh, anti-housing integration types. You know, like now you got a big tent. You got a coalition. And uh, he knew he was destined to run for president, and uh, he was building a coalition as soon as he, uh, in his famous 1963 inaugural address. Yeah, and I mean, what uh, it's such a modern feel to the Wallace 
chapters because he really does, as, as he says, do, he really did set the stage for the politics of resentment. And That's right. How, how that functions, you, you make it big enough that it appeals to everyone, but everyone hears what their, their particular resentment is in that. That's right. And, and the other thing within that, so you have that big canvas, but then he also falls forward constantly. He never wins anything. I mean, he wins elections, but in terms of policies and things like that, you know, the federal government comes in, he fights them, he loses, but he but he loses the fight with the feds, but he wins the domestic politics or the state politics because uh, he's the fighting judge. He's the fight, you know, he's their guy. Um, and uh, so they like him as the fighter in the arena. And if he loses, it's just because the they're they're worse than we are. They're bigger than we are. But we got our guy. We got our guy in the arena. And it's it's George Wallace. Um, and um, yeah, I Wallace was kind of a genius. <laughs> you know, I mean, uh, yeah, a political genius. You know, I I think I used the quote in there that um, you know he's a militant anti-communist. But if uh, Wallace had been dropped into the Albanian countryside in the 1960s, he would have been you know head of the Politburo in like six months or something, right? And and I think that's it. Doesn't matter what it was. He he understood the political levers that needed to be pulled to get himself into the next position, and that's and in, in that moment, that era perhaps still it was race well and i i see him as such a great wonderful metaphor for to write on all this kind of like southern resentment and kind of the the what you masterfully used as a thread through the book is this white anti-racialized anti-statism and right. you know using that as kind of the foundational document of our nation it's written into the constitution all the way to Wallace, you can see how it keeps readapting to its readapting to keep itself getting power and votes. Just that's right, and and that's what I love about you know the inaugural. We all you know when we teach uh, desegregation, civil rights era, we point to the Wallace address, nineteen sixty three, where he says, "Segregation now, segregation tomorrow, segregation forever." You know, a line written uh, written by a Klansman. But what, what I think it's that's interesting. Okay, great. We see militant resistance to civil rights. But what's more interesting is he mentions freedom two dozen times in that speech, in some way for liberty, freedom, free citizens, whatever. And what does that mean? That's a much more interesting question about the nature of American politics. Like, why does freedom resonate so profoundly? Uh, yet we we point to the segregationist rhetoric but what really mattered to him was that freedom stuff yeah and that's it it, it really comes through in the book and, and it's a very well um reasoned argument so i guess kind of wrapping things up um yep. you end the book kind of um with a, a coats a paragraph from uh, Tim, mm -hmm. Quotes about freedom and kind of this um, exactly what you were talking about. So maybe you could kind of give us like your final uh, elevator pitch for what <laughs> what where what happened and where we are now. Right. Well, you know, um, well, to me, yeah, the, the, the you know, the, the Coates quote is actually from a essay about Kanye. <laughs> it's called White Like Kanye. Um but um, but yeah, the, the whiteness as a form of white freedom is a form of belligerence and control and uh, arrogance and and I'll get mine and the hell with you. And I think that's 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 really revealing. But like the the thing that sort of really got me, though, about this story that made everything clear to me about the future of American politics and where we need to go next was when Jose Williams was, um, it was Martin Luther King's uh, a lieutenant, was trying to figure out why some counties after the Civil Rights, uh, the Voting Rights Act were had really good organizing drives and others had less successful organizing drives. And he's like, it didn't have to do with the movement. It didn't have to do with the leadership. It didn't have to do with anything. What it had to do with was one single variable. And it took him a long time to figure it out. And that was whether there was a federal registrar on the ground registering those people. And that is the takeaway. If we want a democracy, there has to be federal enforcement of voting rights. 
there's to be federal enforcement of a lot of things. Um, that's and that states' rights and local rights is antithetical to a progressive vision for American freedom. 